Welcome to Mafia, a new podcast telling stories of America's criminal underworld. Gotti assumed the position of head of the Gambino family. And using the name Donnie Brasco, I was able to infiltrate the uh, Bonanno uh, crime family in New York City. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. One man changed the whole texture and landscape of crime in America. Listen to Mafia every Wednesday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, the astronomy podcast with me, your host, Andrew Dunkley, and from the Australian Astronomical Observatory, Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. I was just ruminating as to what kind of nut you are. Um, I mean, I, I think I'm a cashew, kind of bent in the middle. I, so I'm <laughs> thinking pistachio because I'm green with envy. <laughs> a bit green. <laughs> That was pretty good. That oh, was right you. off the cuff. Yeah, not bad at all. <laughs> now, today, uh, we're going to uh, look at the weather on Jupiter. Uh, they've been doing some um, analysis of the gas giant, and, um, well, they've come up with a colour picture of uh, all sorts of filtered wavelengths and uh, you name it, and uh, it's a pretty sight. But uh, I, I expect you'll explain what we're actually looking at. The other thing that's uh, in the news at the moment is uh, that apparently they've been looking for years for uh, black holes orbiting each other as a result of merging galaxies, and now, um, voila, they've they've found them, uh, which is going to, um, well, be very exciting, if not already. And junk on Mars. Yes, apparently it's true. Aliens have landed. Well, not quite. Well, yes, quite, because we're the aliens. That's the way I think it'll go. Anyway, first up, Fred, let's uh, talk about the weather on Jupiter, which has been uh, spectacularly photographed, and um, the pictures are startling. Uh, in indeed they are, Andrew. And I guess we're, we're all used to seeing revolutionary detailed images of Jupiter, particularly the poles of Jupiter, now that the Juno spacecraft is in orbit around the planet, which will be for a little while to come yet. But the image that certainly caught my attention this week, and you're right about the psychedelic colouring, it's really interesting to look at. Uh, this is an Earth-based image, or an, a, an image taken from a, uh, a ground-based telescope. In fact, um, one of the two Gemini telescopes. Gemini is a, is a multinational project. Uh, they run two eight-metre class telescopes, one in Hawaii, one in Chile. Uh, and what they have done is used uh, an, a, an instrument which is called NIRI, N-I-R-I, which stands for, well, you can probably guess it, Near Infrared Imager. I wouldn't have guessed that no, I'm afraid <laughs> it's not it's not near because it's near the telescope <laughs> it's it's near infrared and near infrared is what we call short wavelength it means it's it's not very far beyond what we can see beyond normal red infrared of course is is light that is red, redder than red um, so what the Gemini scientists have done and it's in fact the, the Hawaiian telescope that's done this um, they've taken images of the planet Jupiter uh, using this near-infrared imager and taken separate pictures at different wavelengths. Now, what that means is essentially different colours, although it's a bit funny to think about colours for something that is uh, in infrared and is actually invisible. But yes, infrared radiation has colours as well. So they've, they've isolated five different colours in the infrared spectrum, and then they've formed a composite image from those. It's actually the same technique uh, that my colleague David Malin pioneered back in the 1980s using um, sort of uh, standard colour images with, a, with an optical telescope. He used to use blue, green and red filters and then combine the images taken separately through each of those uh, in order to make uh, a, a genuine true colour image, one that we would see if our eyes were billions of times more sensitive. Well, the guys at Gemini have done the same thing, but with infrared. So what you've got is a, is a colour image of the planet itself, really showing quite startling colour differences. And the colour differences, while they look pleasing to the eye, 
and nevertheless telling scientists that different stuff is going on uh, in these different regions of the planet Jupiter. Yeah, I think I, I, the, the thing that sticks out straight away when you look at the image is the big red spot, which is not a big red spot in this picture. <laughs> it's a big white one, it that's is, right. It is, yeah. Uh, and that, so what that tells you is that it's sort of equally reflective in all the colour bands that the image was taken in because it's turned out white. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, it's a neutral colour. Um, and what the scientists are telling us is that that white is actually revealed uh, by um, uh, uh, high altitude clouds and hazes uh, right at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere. So if you've got these high altitude clouds in Jupiter's atmosphere, and remember Jupiter's a, a gas giant, we, we never see a solid surface, we just see the upper layer of the cloud deck. Um, things that are white in colour are very near the surface of the atmosphere. As I said, high altitude clouds and hazes. Um, and that tells you that the Great Red Spot, rather than being something deeply ingrained in Jupiter's atmosphere, which certainly is the way it looks when you get a, a standard colour image of it, it's a very high altitude feature. What it probably is telling you, in fact, is that the Great Red Spot uh, extends to very high altitudes. It pr probably penetrates really low down into the, into the atmosphere. Um, there's also some remarkable structure. I mean, this is a beautiful image that has been taken, considering it's a telescope on the ground. Gemini is one of the pioneering uh, faculties for, um, um, I beg your pardon, that was the wrong word, one of the pioneering facilities <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> they've probably got a faculty as well. I'd say so. Um, one of the pioneering facilities for what we call adaptive optics imaging. In other words, um, taking the twinkle out of starlight, taking the distortion out that the atmosphere puts in uh, by compensating for that electronically. And what you get is an image that essentially freezes the detail, very, a very fine detail. And in fact, what you can see in this image is really delicate structure in the wake of the, uh, of the Great Red Spot, which of course is a, an anticyclone, basically a huge storm. Mm. It's bigger than the Earth, by the way. It's um, about one and a half times the diameter of the Earth. It's been around for at least 300 years. Uh, people uh, in the vicinity of Jupiter might well be wondering when this storm is going to give up and stop, but it hasn't done yet. Um, and the other thing that I thought was very noticeable is a kind of orange glow near the poles of Jupiter, the North and South Pole. Yeah. Uh, poles. And, and we, we know that um, Jupiter, because it has a, a magnetic field that's thousands of times stronger than the Earth's, it generates uh, aurorae. The aurora borealis and aurora australis are very bright on Jupiter. And apparently these uh, high altitude hazes that are causing the orange glow at uh, the poles is the result of chemistry that comes from some of these uh, aur auroral phenomena in the atmosphere. Most amazing. And uh, you mentioned David Malan, and I've seen a lot of his work. And uh, it, it's really fascinating to think that something he developed over 30 years ago is still holding true in the technological world that we now live in. It's amazing. It is. And actually, David deserves a lot more credit than he gets for the fact that he pioneered these techniques, which are now used by amateur astronomers all over the world to make photographs that really rival what we were producing on the Anglo-Australian telescope 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because of modern electronic detectors, of course, but it also speaks volumes for the, for the prowess of amateur astronomers in the work that's going on these days. It's yes, fabulous indeed. stuff. Fantastic. And that, uh, that picture of Jupiter is very much worth uh, delving into and having a look at, and we might use it as our cover image for this episode. So if you're looking at Jupiter right now, that's because... That's what I suggested would be. The <laughs> I don't actually get a say in that, but I do make suggestions from time to time. There's only one what more. Makes you, Sorry, what on. makes you think anybody's going to take any notice of you? Nobody ever does. It's, you know, that's just the way it is. That's the way it is. Yes. Uh, only one more thing to add uh, before we move on to the next segment, Fred. You say Gemini, I say Gemini. You say Neri, <laughs> I say Neri. Gemini, Gemini, Neri, Neri. Let's call the whole I, thing off. Uh, don't, don't give up your day job, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't yet. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, with that um, awful offbeat, off-tune, out-of-the-universe thing we just did, uh, let's move on to Black Holes, where that song deserves to be. And, uh, <laughs> in fact, in fact, they have um, now discovered 
two black holes orbiting each other as a result of merging galaxies. I think that's how I understand what I read, and you'll be able to confirm or otherwise, but I also believe they've been looking for this phenomenon for a very long time. Indeed they have, and now they've found it. So um, this story is about observations made actually with a gigantic radio telescope, not uh, uh, optical or visible light telescopes or infrared telescopes like the Gemini work, sorry, Gemini work we were just <laughs> describing there a minute ago. Um, these are observations made with uh, a, an array of radio telescopes, uh, which uh, is situated in, uh, in New Mexico. It's uh, called the... Uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, it's all right. It's the it's the it's New the, Mexico telescope. No, no, it's thing. not. No, this is ridiculous. <laughs> it's the, uh, the the very large array, the VLA. So well, how could one forget a name so eloquent as that? The in, VLA. Indeed. Yes. I mean, it should. I, I knew it would be something like that because. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> I've been um, I've been thinking about Alma, the other radio array, uh, for for too long, and uh, I kind of wanted to say Alma, but I knew Alma wasn't right. They're separated by rather a long way. Could be Alma. So yes. Anyway, carry on. The, 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 the VLA. Uh, the VLA is capable, because it's a, a gigantic array of radio telescopes, as I said, situated in New Mexico, it's capable of, of resolving or probing fine detail in space, almost second to, to no other facility uh, in, in, in the world. And that's because by separating these various radio antennae, you can actually probe uh, very finely what's going on in the depths of the universe. So, so the astronomers uh, conducting this research have basically uh, lo locked onto a radio galaxy with the eloquent name of 0402 plus 379. Nice. Which, yes, it's a nice one, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you can hear snoring... Uh, Andrew, mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can detect that. Is that it's, Mandu? It is, yeah. <laughs> for those who are joining us for the first time or recently, <laughs> Mandu is Fred's cat, as in cat Mandu. Yeah, is he snoring? He's, he's, I think he's heard us. He's just <clears throat> given up, but he was snoring very loudly. <laughs> I did hear one or two <laughs> in the background there. Yeah, it's no wonder I'm short sure asleep. Oh, anyway... Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mandu. Uh, the, the, so what the gentlemen and ladies of the University of New Mexico uh, have been doing uh, is using this uh, la very large array to look at this galaxy in fine detail, and they've detected evidence of black holes. Now, black holes don't shine. They're black. But what they do is they gather material, material around them, which basically is being swallowed up. It doesn't just sort of go straight down. It basically swirls around the black holes in a thing we call the accretion disk. It's because the black hole is accreting or collecting material. And the accretion disk is a very high energy part of the universe uh, because all this stuff is is banging into its uh, neighbors, jostling along, and it actually... Uh, emits uh, radiation at quite a, a range of wavelengths, including X-rays and infrared rays that we were just talking about, and radio waves, uh, which are what have been picked up. So two black holes detected in the centre of one galaxy, mm. and that is the smoking gun for this galaxy having grown to, his present, to its present size by merging with another galaxy. Um, we, we think all galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. Ours has one uh, with a mass of about 3.6 million times the mass of the sun. It's 25,000 light years away as the crow flies, so no danger from that. It, there's an accretion disk around it, and that's all very well behaved because it's so far away. But in this case, these two black holes have a combined mass of 15 billion times that of the sun. Wow. So they are actually right at the upper range of, of these this species of objects, supermassive black holes. Uh, so the fact that there are two of them kind of points towards the idea that there has been a merger um, between two galaxies. And what we're seeing is the, the, the sort of end product of that merger, and that is two black holes gradually spiralling around one another until they eventually coalesce. And was, you might remember... Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask about, you if they, if they will combine or collide or whatever it is they're going to do. 
Um, they will, but uh, the, apparently they're moving so slowly at the moment that the estimated time to that coalescence is something like um, three times the present age of the universe, oh. which, by, by which time people tend to have lost interest yeah. in this kind of thing. Um, how do they know that they're swirling around one another? That's the trick, and that's the key to this research, and it's what makes it such a stunning piece of astronomy. Um, the the uh, resolution of this radio array, by that I mean its ability to pinpoint fine detail, it's such that they've actually detected the motion of one black hole relative to the other. Uh -huh. um, uh, they're measuring um, angles, uh, changes in angle, of something like a millionth of an arc second per year. Now, an arc second is the angle that a one dollar coin subtends at your eye if you hold it up five kilometers away. Oh. So he gets somebody to hold a coin up, a one dollar coin, and you're five kilometers away from it. The angle that that coin makes in your eye is one arc second. But these guys are detecting um, one millionth of that amount in order to measure the motion, the relative motion of these black holes. Um, it is a triumphant piece of research. And, uh, you know, it's uh, really quite remarkable that we've, we've been seeing merging black holes now at two completely different scales. The gravitational wave uh, observations that uh, so far have revealed three black hole collisions, um, three merging black holes, and now we're seeing one that is um, um, on a much different scale. The two black holes are nowhere near each other, they're nowhere near merging, but it tells us that it's a fairly common phenomenon throughout the universe, that probably the centers of many galaxies have more than one black hole. So you can be sure that the VLA, the Very Large Array, will be uh, casting its, uh, its uh, electronic eyes heavenwards uh, looking for more of these things. And uh, no doubt uh, here on Space Nuts, we'll talk about them. Yes, I hope so. And for those who uh, don't know how big an Australian $1 coin is, it's about the size of a US quarter, just so you well, know. So you can do that experiment. Or, or, uh, or about the size of a UK pound. There you are. There you are. Pound Very coin. Good. It's about the same. Yeah. And, and one more thought on this. Um, we recently spoke about the potential for two galaxies to merge, and I can't remember which ones they are. Ours and another one might have been. Uh, so <laughs> the same thing might happen there in a squillion years. It, indeed, it will. That's right. Um, because the uh, it's the nearest. Is it, big an, was it Andromeda? It's Andromeda, that's hey. right, which at the moment is about um, about two and a half million light years, light years away, very close in astronomical standards. Uh, and our galaxy and Andromeda are racing towards each other. I can't remember what the figure is. I think it once again has a two in it, something like uh, 250 or thereabouts kilometers per second. I'll have to look that up. But um, at that rate, it's going to be about three billion years before there's a collision. And no doubt um, we will bring the news of that to you on Space Nuts we as well. We will indeed, absolutely. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley, that's me, and Fred Watson, that's him. What a matchup! And what a team, Mike! Metro PCS and the iPhone SE for $0 on a network that covers 99% of people in the U.S. Oh, impressive. <laughs> Play with the best. Switch to Metro PCS and get a 32 gig iPhone SE for zero dollars. Metro PCS. Coverage not available in some areas. Plus sales tax and ten dollar activation fee. Claim based on talking tax. Not valid for active numbers currently on our T-Mobile network or active on Metro PCS in the past ninety days. See store for details and terms and conditions. Three, two, one. Space nuts. Finally, Fred, snoring cats and bad singing aside, we're going to uh, investigate. Uh, a discovery on Mars, which basically shows, in my humble opinion, that we've already pretty well polluted another planet. And that is the, the discovery of a shiny metallic object on Mars, which many are already jumping on and saying, oh, it's the aliens. Well, it is. But we're the aliens, I reckon. That's what I think. Anyway, please explain. I mean, this has been going crazy in the media. They absolutely go nuts over this. Uh, I think that's great. I mean, it doesn't matter it, as long as it draws attention to the world of space science and astronomy. Uh, that's uh, that's all that counts. So, yes, a remarkable photograph from uh, NASA's Opportunity rover. And remember, Opportunity has been working on Mars for better part of 
14, no, it's 13 years now. It's 2004 when, uh, when it touched down. This was the rover that was given a 90-day lifespan, yeah. uh, or at least a 90-day guarantee, and it's still going strong. It's, it's fabulous yeah, stuff. It's so old that they've uh, had to try and get it back because someone needs some Model T board part. <laughs> Probably, yes. Um, so an, Im an infrared image uh, made with its camera, which uh, has uh, got high contrast to it to emphasize the fine detail. Um, apparently it was uploaded on the 17th of March from Opportunity uh, to Earth. And sure enough, it shows something decidedly shiny and metallic and regular in shape lying on the dusty plains of Mars, which is where Opportunity is. It's in the equatorial region of Mars. Um, it's a, a really nice image. I don't know. I thought it was a slightly bent biscuit tin lid. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really hard to tell. I, I tried enlarging the image and it just pixelated so badly I, I couldn't tell what it was. But uh, it, it's obviously metal and it's obviously foreign. Um, yeah, and... The, the big question so what is, is what is it and where did it come from and, you know, who's, well, who is responsible for this, as a teacher me, used to say to me? Let me give you a clue here. Uh, and that is the opportunities course as it tra uh, traverses the Martian landscape basically takes it along the line it made when it was still airborne and its lander was approaching the surface. Uh, and now opportunity uh, like... Um, like its fellow uh, rover Spirit, which is sadly now defunct. Uh, if I remember rightly, they both landed by means of uh, the sort of, um, the, 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 I don't know what you call it, the bubble technique. It oh, was a, the bouncing, a ball thing. bouncing ball thing. That's yeah, right. That'll do. Um, and so if you sort of bounce along the Martian landscape uh, with your lander and its defunct casing. It's now, Bits uh, drop it's off. now used, yes, it's now used heat shield and things of that sort. You're going to find bits dropping off. And apparently this is not the first discarded bit of debris that Opportunity has photographed during its course. And you don't have to look too far on the web to see one or two of those bent bits of metal, which of course are what uh, allowed the project to be so successful. They protected the spacecraft and they are now no longer in, um, in, in, in any kind of requirement other than little ornaments that will probably stay on the surface of Mars for the next million years or so mm. uh, before they get sandblasted to bits by the Martian dust storms that we occasionally see. But it is, it's a lovely story and, and you're quite right, everybody thinks um, of aliens. Um, when you look at the scale of it, it suggests that the aliens, if they were to come out of this biscuit tin lid or whatever it is, would be about the size of an ant or something like that yeah. because it's not very far away. Um, so maybe uh, the discarded debris is the right solution to this problem. And, and we are the aliens. We did it. We, we so did we're, it. We're the aliens. That's right. We're yeah. the ones messing up the universe. Or at least our corner of it. Yes. Oh, well, it's a little disappointing that it wasn't, you know, some other species or some other intelligent creature that, that, that did this. But uh, I think we're throwing snowballs at fires when we start believing that sort of stuff at this point in time. But, um, you know, we, we still live ever hopeful that we'll find something out there, Fred, and you and I will be able to talk about that when it is ultimately discovered. And <laughs> I'm pretty sure it will be. But it also brings up, just to finish off, on a more serious note, the issue that you've often brought up, and that is um, polluting other planets also puts a risk to any potential life form that might exist, microbial or otherwise. Yes, that's right. And actually, Mars is particularly vulnerable to that because we know there are a few pockets of liquid water there, and liquid water is where we believe um, microbial life can thrive. So um, any spacecraft that's sent, actually any spacecraft that's sent anywhere in the solar system has to conform to what are called planetary protection rules. Um, going to Mars uh, invokes the highest level of planetary protection rules, which, which if I remember rightly, means that the spacecraft has to be sterilized to the level that there are no more than uh, I'm dragging around in my memory here, but I think it's 30 spores per square meter or something like that on the surface uh, of uh, terrestrial bacteria, because we know bacteria can actually survive the rigors of space. Yeah. So a Martian, a Martian rover like Opportunity will have been thoroughly cleaned before it was sent. And I've seen reports from NASA that that sterilization process actually uh, amounts to something like 
10% of the total cost of emissions. So it's wow. by far from trivial, by no means trivial. Indeed. All right. Well, yeah. now we know what it is and it's all very disappointing. And uh, <laughs> we'll just get on with it now. But let, let the, uh, um, I don't know, conspiracy theorists just blunder away on the internet with all their explanations and ideas <laughs> it's fun to read though uh, the trouble Fred, is andrew one day they might be right yeah they might they <laughs> might absolutely be right yes and that would be an interesting day indeed fred yeah. as always a great pleasure thank you great pleasure to talk to you too andrew see you next time yes uh, fred was uh, laughing when we started uh, before we started recording because i'm in my closet we had to do this from my house today because of time factors and the most quiet place in my house is the, the wardrobe. So Fred's looking at all our clothes at the moment. He's a very <laughs> tolerant man indeed. Thank you, Fred, and we'll catch you next time. And thank you for listening uh, to Space Nuts. And uh, we'll hope to catch up with you again very, very soon. And that wasn't Mandu, was it? <laughs> and uh, we no, will... it, that, was a, that was an accident. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not worried about a thing. We'll get this thing finished sooner or later. Anyway, um, from me, Andrew Dunkley, goodbye and thank you for listening. Don't forget to tell your friends and follow us on Facebook. And don't forget to send us your questions. And from Fred Watson, the fifth Yorkshireman, it's goodbye <laughs> until next time from Space Nuts. Hi, champion. See you later, lad. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audio Boom, and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com. Welcome to Mafia, a new podcast telling stories of America's criminal underworld. Gotti assumed the position of head of the Gambino family. And using the name Donnie Brasco, I was able to infiltrate the uh, Bonanno uh, crime family in New York City. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. One man changed the whole texture and landscape of crime in America. Listen to Mafia every Wednesday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows.